Good evening. Welcome to the River Falls Municipal Utility Advisory Board meeting for Monday, September 17th. Could we have the roll call, please? Chesky? Here. Odin? Here. Richter? Here. Swanson? Here. Toom? Here. Wells Mangold? Spafford? Looking for uh, approval of the minutes from the July 23rd, 2018 meeting. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same. Mints are approved. Uh, now's the time of our meeting for public comments. If anybody has anything that they'd like to speak on, they can come forward. Anybody? We'll move on. Uh, the consent agenda, which is the acknowledgement of the West Central Biosolids Facility Commission meetings and the Powerful Choices Committee meeting minutes for approval on those. I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same. Consent agenda is approved. And now we have a few reports in front of us. You know what I was thinking, it's been a couple months since we've been together, and I know Wayne and Ron and his crews and myself have been working on a ton of projects, and they're not really projects that take UAB approval or we having those type of interactions, but you, you folks are the eyes and ears of our community, and I think it's good that you hear from these guys what's been going on in our community utility-wise. You may have questions. This may stir questions, but I think it's good just to be aware. Um, we have a ton of projects going on throughout the community, and we're here tonight to just give you a little update of what's going on and answer questions. So, okay. Perfect. Thanks. Thank and, you. Uh, Wayne, are you going to go first tonight? Sure. All right. Good evening. There it goes. Start with you, Wayne, and just go. Like on this one right here, that's up there. Yep. Anybody recognize where that is? Gulf View, View Drive. So coming from the left on the lower bottom down there, that's how it comes where it comes under Highway 35, and then it goes around and up the hill. So there's an area highlighted there, and. Wayne's crew has been doing some work with boring over like the last two years. We've had a uh, really high amount of outages due to cable failures. Yep. What year was that cable in there, Wayne? Uh, that is 1987 cable in the, basically the highlighted section uh, in that area. Yeah. And so. that in that 1987 cable, we were scheduled to replace it next year. And what yep. was happening, we were getting one, two, and I think even up to three this year, cable failures where the cable's failing. So Wayne used his discretion and we moved it up from replacing it next year to this year and we're getting it done right now just because that cable is going, going, now it's gone. So gone. we used our boring contract and uh, to go in there, have the borers, borers go in there and bore that, which, is, which allows for limited damage to the neighborhood. <laughs> And uh, we, and that project is in what phase now? Is it almost done? Uh, the directional boring has been completed, and now it's the uh, our work is is started with replacing the equipment, uh, setting up outages with the customers in the area, um, and working through landscaping, uh, directional boring. Obviously, it, it's kind of a mess at times, so it's it's cleaning up the area and making it as best we can for the residents in their homes. Uh, that they landscaped around our equipment. And today I got a voicemail from somebody in that area. I think it's 1747 or somebody in the middle. Yep. And you hear the voicemails on these projects and you usually kind of hold your breath as a voicemail goes along thinking something's wrong and very positive response today. So she was just calling to say thank you and what a great job the boring crew did. They were courteous, they were hardworking. So that was, that was, that was nice to hear. Yeah, that's a one in a thousand. Uh, <laughs> we get those. Where, where, where someone takes honest. the time, right, to do yeah, that. Absolutely. So. No more electric bill for her the rest of her life. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you probably just made her night for sure. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it was it was very nice to hear from the public. Um, usually, it's it's always a concern that they have, and we're always trying to work our way through it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, those cable failures were getting irritating there. So anyway, should be should be better. Yes. But, but the cables are safe from squirrel damage, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're going to talk about that later. That's <laughs> a good segue. Is there much of the town that's 
buried cable like that? Uh, yes, we have about, uh, we're, in, we're approaching about 70% of the town is actually underground cable. Um, so we haven't quite gone to the point of replacing the overhead with underground cable, but mm -hmm. we've had discussions on, on that. And the tipping point will be cost savings onto the customers. That's probably a statistic that people would, wouldn't really normally guess easily that we're close to 70% underground in this town because the core of town is all overhead. But anything after a certain age, we all put underground. So. Yep. And it's a shame that this is 1987 cable because we still have 1973 is the oldest that I've seen. Um, I'm knocking on wood. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, with the fault and faults in this location and that was just three this this year there was two or three last year so it was beyond time for this this area i might be getting into too much detail but that cable of that era the neutral the wire on there is on the outside of that cable and it wasn't jacketed it was exposed yep. so over time what happens is that just corrodes and wears down and that creates the failures yep. the cable we put in today is jacketed cable and that concentric neutral is not exposed and the cable should last longer yep. yeah Th this cable uh, that we're installing now the company uh, is, is approaching 50 years without having a failure on it that's not lightning induced dig ins or it's a manufacturer's defect has not had anything almost 50 years in the, in the timeline that they've been in business right so sorry wayne go ahead no it's Water. good it's Water good discussion <laughs> come on there it goes obviously it's two 2018 projects with the electric department um my first slide was actually started in last year, once it quits thinking here, it was, um, is the power plant substation. The project is almost to the end. It's about 95, 97% complete. Uh, we have a few minor, come on, a few minor things to do. We have, there it goes. So, pictures, you can quite see it, but uh, the old fence in front of the old uh, power plant building was removed here the first part of September. As you go by there now, um, all you'll see is the new fence around the substation. Uh, we just have a few minor projects of, we have an old pole to remove, a transmission pole, uh, so a green hut that's back on the west side of the project. And then uh, we have a firewall to also install by the transformer. So. Wayne kind of underplayed the fence removal there, but that used to be barbed wire fence along the sidewalk and along the building, and that has been removed. So aesthetically, much more pleasing as you come by there now. The, the high barbed wire fence is gone. We do have high 10-foot fences there now, but uh, the barbed wire along the sidewalk has been removed and off-site, so we're happy with that. Yeah, we removed some of the old fence and moved it in strategic locations uh, to help keep the public from getting too far behind some of the buildings and exposing themselves to getting up on top of the power plant and doing whatever. So <clears throat> this here is, is a project that's always ongoing for us is, what I got here is just a pole in front of the power plant, but that's city fiber that uh, we help the IT department uh, string around the city and, and grow the network as they see fit down the road. Let me build on that. So one of the objectives of the utilities in the IT department is to have fiber optic run to all city facilities throughout the city, which includes wells, pumps, lift stations, yep. um, cold storage buildings, the, the, your, uh, the city garage of facility. Course. I mean, so you want fiber everywhere so you can do uh, SCADA systems, cameras, security, yep. monitoring through the fiber system. So that's been going on for a couple of years and that continues. Yep. We've identified a couple pieces way on the end of the, of the line, lift stations and whatnot, that we're probably not gonna be able to get fiber to, where we'll still continue to use radio control and radio yep. monitoring, but uh, the objective is to get fiber to all the facilities to allow for better communication amongst all facilities for information, data, and monitoring. Yep. Uh, then, then next to here was we have Heritage Park. You can see that there was some work done here this past summer. Uh, some of the work hasn't been completed yet. We got new streetlights 
and the old street lights are going to be coming out at some point this fall. Hopefully, the poles were supposed to be shipped out in uh, the 24th of August, but I just got a phone call last Friday saying they were still in South Carolina. Um, okay. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they can get them out, or they have to float them out. So, uh, fingers crossed that we can still get those uh, that infrastructure. Let me talk a little bit more about Heritage Park. So Wayne kind of underplayed the street lighting there. So right now, I think we counted nine different types of street lights out in Heritage Park right now. Yep. Those will be coming out. We're going to have one common look, the same look that is in the alley yep. and on the bridge, correct? On the bridge and along the pathway that's out yeah. here. So the decorative the lighting is going to be in that parking lot. Another thing that you probably won't see happening there, but we've been reacting to all the events that go on in Heritage Park whether it's Bacon Bash, River Falls Days, the Art on the Kinney, all those things. We continually move around our temporary electric locations. And these guys have been very accommodating, even putting in poles, taking out poles. I think we're gonna make more of a permanent temporary situation so we're, we don't continue to spend literally days for each event doing this. And then they'll have to get to where our temporary power is. We're gonna talk to Chris Yep. and the event organizers and then come up with one common location where our panels will sit and they'll remain hopefully for at least for the next few years so we're not continually right. going in there and moving stuff and replacing stuff yep. that's the objective isn't it wayne it is the objective i mean we already have installed uh conduit underneath the new blacktop prior to this with plans of something uh, temporary power on the east side of the parking lot to right facilitate any of the events that go on in Heritage Park. And we love helping those events, but I think we just kind of, we keep moving stuff and we just need to get a settled spot. And it's, it's time and consuming, uh, you know, time consuming leads to expenses. So it's trying to streamline. Yeah. Can I ask about that? It's a Absolutely. city park um, where the utilities, can we, I mean, are we within our own rights to just say we'd like power here, 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 and here, and decide to make it permanent? What's preventing? that's kind of yeah, we, you know, with in collaboration, we're gonna that's that's kind of the objective. Yeah. To say, Chris, rather than have the stage on this end this year, and then decide you're gonna move it up here next year, let's just pick a spot. We recommend here. Yep. We're gonna put up our permanent temporary situation, permanent temporary power, <laughs> yep. permanent temporary power. <laughs> I guess you can say that. Yep. Um, and then just have one spot, so we're not flipping back and forth and allowing every event to say, no, we want that 40 feet over here, 20 feet here, and it's going to be here. Just, it just, again, we don't mind doing it. It just takes a lot of time and money. It, it does. It takes up a lot of our time. Uh, new vendors want different power needs. It, it's, it adds to the time it takes for us to help these events be the success that they are. Right. So we won't dictate per se, but we're going to try to collaborate and come up with a final spot. Uh, again, here's another movie theater project that uh, it's kind of uh, off the bank of the Heritage Park is the theater is getting an underground service um, along with Mel's next to it. Um, there's a few street lights, new street lights that were installed there. It's kind of hard to see in that picture, but uh, we're working with one of the electricians in the area on uh, getting that transferred over here in the next week or two uh, so that the movie theater and Mel's would be underground uh, permanently from the pole structure itself, the overhead line structure. So somebody might ask why uh, on that. So the little history there is when the theater was proposing to do some work and add another screen, they were looking to go for a grant. And part of that grant was they, they would get matching funds to work that the city would do to do improvements in the alley yep. and on the main street. So we gave them a bit of what it would cost to do this. And we said we would make these improvements and uh, it's good for the community it's a more reliable service it's better aesthetically with the lights so we're following through on our end of what we said we would do if they got the grant and they did get the grant and there's a second screen there so we're happy to do it and they're just cleaning up that alley uh winners winter street transformer move <laughs> sorry walnut <laughs> thank you <laughs> um Many, maybe of you have seen the transformer that used to sit by this steel structure um, as you entered Family Fresh, uh, no longer sits there. Um, so, we, yeah, I was going to say, we built this brand new uh, trail system. It ends right at the intersection of Walnut and where Family Fresh parking lot is. Then it kind of comes up towards Main Street. When you get halfway between 
the, the new pathway at the end of Walnut Street at the corner of the parking lot and you come up towards Main Street, there's this big metal pole, which is right in the middle of the sidewalk. And then next to it was a giant transformer. And there was about 18 inches between those two. And anybody walking there had this brand new path. You had to squeeze between the transformer and the pole to kind of continue towards Main Street. So it was kind of the new path to nowhere. Right. So we were able to eliminate that transformer. And now the sidewalk, I talked to Reed Ronsky, the sidewalk is going to continue on, just, just bump around the pole and continue on towards Main Street. So we're going to connect the sidewalk on Main Street to the new pathway because we took out the transformer. Yep. And the infamous <laughs> woodpecker re with repair. Um, I did talk to, with Mr. Machuski uh, here a couple weeks ago on on this repair, but uh, it, it brings lime to limelight to what uh, the pileated woodpeckers do to our not only our distribution system but our transmission system. Um, we've been working on woodpecker repair now probably about eight years. Um, it's uh, it's continually evolving as the woodpeckers woodpeckers grow. You, you got a picture of them right there. These are, so. these, are, these are pileated woodpeckers. They stand about 18 inches tall. Now if you see them flying around, they're around. Big. They yeah. make these huge holes yep. in their structure. They cause major damage. Yep. And so this is called polywater UPR woodpecker repair kit. Yep. There it is. I mean, that's that same picture is blown up, but it looks like a mess, right? It looks like saran wrap. Yeah. That's actual. That's an actual woodpecker repair kit that utilities use. It's expensive to pull. So you 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 fill the hole full of polymer. See that? So you fill the hole with a polymer. Yes. Poly water UPR woodpecker repair. You fill it up with that. You have like an injection thing, and you inject it in there, and then the plastic keeps it keeps it in. <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry about that but we were using a different uh brand and as the the woodpeckers were continuing to abuse our, our wood structures uh it got to the point of where we there was the safety of our line crew uh they couldn't even climb the this this st mm -hmm. the, uh material was so strong that uh we couldn't even get our climbing gear into it um, this this stuff will allow us to get our gals into it and actually climb the pole if we need to. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you very much for that tour, by the way. <laughs> I, you're, you're very welcome. Yeah. I mean, these are just like little things in our system that people don't have any idea about that right. you know, we're trying to battle yep. squirrels and woodpeckers. But these woodpeckers <laughs> cause a lot of damage on wood poles. Yeah, you can see that the, this pole here is in our system right as today. So I took this picture today. Them are holes that where this year, this pole was repaired last year uh, in different spots. So it's a continuing thing that we are trying to manage. Um, and we try to manage it as best we can. But, uh, and thankfully this one's next to a road and we can get to it and get it repaired. But um, we have 12 miles of transmission line that goes through wilderness. Um, so it takes a lot of time and effort to get out there and repair those. So, underground, right? <laughs> so, I, I'm a painter and I'm dealing with these all the time as well. And yep. people always ask, is there any way to prevent this? And I have yet to find one. So, if you find one, let me know and I'll do likewise. But, yeah, um, yeah I, I run it. It's sides of houses. I mean, they're, yeah, they're everywhere. And the big ones are worse. The pileated are, are yeah. terrible. So, yeah, I mean, we've had guys on poles where their arms, two guys, two different trucks, one arm in, the other gentleman's arm in, and they couldn't touch fingers in between how big of a hole that they have done. So it's, it's impressive, but it's, uh, <laughs> if you it see takes these, a lot of material and time. If you see these giant pileated woodpeckers fly, it's like prehistoric. It's like yeah. a pterodactyl. I mean, yep. they're giant. I, I'm, not, I'm not here to scare you, but I'm just here to inform you. <laughs> <laughs> um, where is this pole? It's off in river, <laughs> Riverside, actually. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's a few that uh, get abused up there as well. Most of it's down in Glen Park, and out that way is where most of our damage is. Rise Bakery, um, 
This has been a continuing project for the last year or better. Um, we've installed three different new services to this new expansion. Um, second expansion now to this, this building here on the east side. Uh, we installed one here in the spring because uh, of this new addition. Um, and then they come to us about a month ago and said, where you installed the new stuff on there, what they told us where we could put it is in the way and has to be moved again. So um, this is all billable. It's not um, as assumed by the ratepayers. So I want to get that out there. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's this takes up a lot of our time when we have to redo and redo a, a service to a facility. Yep, the two good news pieces are, like Wayne said, it's billable. They pay for that. Yep. Second good piece of news is, I mean, Rise Bakery continues to expand and grow in River Falls. So. Yeah. Right. Uh, the St. Croix Business Innovation Center, uh, we are working with them currently on their expanding of their, of their service, uh, looking, um, they have the one service there, but uh, as they're growing internally, it, we might have to put a second service into the building at some point because uh, the, their tenants are ramping up and taking up a lot of their main service size. Yeah, more so than we did, more so than we or the planners of that building anticipated. Yep. Um, we have some larger electrical customers there already who have demand. Uh, they're on demand services. That means they're billed on their highest 15 minute interval for the month. That's a large commercial, a larger commercial customer. Yep. And once, so if you have several customers building up demand, you can't just have one meter. You have to have separate meters and it becomes a lot more complicated. So Wayne and with help of WPPI Energy, local electricians and St. Croix Innovation Center is trying to come up with ways that we can most economically get a meter bank to bill for demand for multiple customers in one building. Yep. And, and the trick of this is, you know, re the renters are in here and they're here one day and gone the next. So it's hard to plan for tomorrow in, in that building because it, it, it's just unknown. Mm -hmm. Good news there again is that Innovation Center is filling up. If it's not totally full, it's leased. And uh, we're serving in power. We just have to figure out, figure out how to bill it correctly all Correct. the time. Uh, obviously, this is Aldi's. Um, this is an ongoing project. This is another picture from today there. Um, so we're expanding. We, not only this project, we had to remove the old infrastructure that was on this site as well. Um, for them to put their building up. And uh, actually they've been calling the last three days on where they've been at. So we'll be working on their new primary extension at some point this week. Uh, the latest is they still wanna be open before Thanksgiving, so. Uh, the new Culver's location. Um, the old service has been removed with the old Perkins site. Uh, the new Culver's and now will be if not late this week or early next, we'll be starting the new service on this building as well. And a new transformer and a new location, correct? Correct, yep. The old location was not quite to current code, so they're, yep. they're paying to have the transformer moved and yep. we're supplying them with a new transformer. Yep, up to today's codes. And back to Rice Bakery, this happened about 10 days ago. <laughs> they were digging in their new uh, uh, entrance around the building that they had there and uh, hit hit the conduit thankfully did not hit the primary um, that was going to their old oldest service to the building uh, actually we have to shut them have a shutdown with them on Sunday to repair this so that they can uh, continue to uh, move forward with their curb and gutter and blacktop in this area so and then here's our golf view cable replacement. Directional boring with, you know, this is the company, td and I, maintenance out of Hudson, did, did the work. Um, so, yeah, is there any questions? Cons it's, uh, and that's just a small list of what we as the utility do every day. These are obviously the highlights you know, of the, what we're doing, the major project that's the squirrels and the, everything else that comes up that we still have to deal with. In about 
six weeks, the big one's coming up, holiday lighting. Yes, I was going to mention that. Everyone, we're known for that, so that's, whatever we do all throughout the year, we're known for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, right? You, Wayne does, they do, his crews do all this stuff all year long, and then yep. really it's, you, we're judged on the holiday lighting. <laughs> make sure the bulbs are on. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Well, it looked really good last year. That did. It did. It did. It was, it was a great improvement. Stay tuned for the good tweaks this year. It's even going to be just a little bit better, maybe. Yep. Yep. So. All right. Thanks, Wayne. Thank you. Appreciate it. I kind of broke it down here so you can see the first um, first one here. We're looking at uh, wastewater. If you got a minute, I don't know how many of you have seen this, but it's kind of a short video. It does shows the monoform process. I know board member Swanson was out when they were up last time and kind of watched it, but this is kind of a quick overview of. I don't know why it won't. Yeah. Uh, where am I at here? Glasses here. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think it's right. Is it this one? Right there? Yeah, I think when you go to this and just click on it, it should go. I'll have you know, improved technology for the council chambers is in uh, the next budget. <laughs> yes. I know Kevin Swanson has been out and has seen a little bit of this, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I guess it is. There we go.
for an uh, exterior form, put their form inside, fill it full of concrete, and you have a new manhole. Structurally, it's as, you know, as strong as a new one. So a lot of those old brick manholes, I mean, they were a work of art, actually. Those guys that took the time to sit there and stack those bricks and stagger them all the way up. They, uh, the guys spent a lot of time on it, a lot of labor hours there. So Ron, how, some of those, how uh, early do those date back to? The 1900? Oh, so I'm mean, brick manholes. They were putting those in pre-turn of the century, so prior to 1900. I'm guessing the ones we have here, yeah, early 1900, some of them. I don't know. We're getting fewer and fewer every year getting them out of the system. I mean, the brick is there yet, but, mm -hmm. you know, they've got concrete poured around them. So we did, what did we do, 16 this year? I think we did 17 last year. That's kind of the average. So, yeah, we're chipping away on them. We're making progress. When Kevin Swanson was out, he saw a couple abandoned sewer lines, and then we capped those. You want to talk about that? Yeah. What we do there? I mean, you know, over the years, there probably was an old house or something sitting on the corner. Their sewer line ran into the manhole. Um, basically, what they do there is they just block them off, mortar them shut, and we don't have to deal with them again. We don't have to worry about infiltration or anything from those old laterals. So... Typically, that's what it was. It was the easiest place to tie into, so they'd go right to the manhole, and the house got tore down, not in use anymore. So whether we have to do dye testing or whatever we have to do to make sure to verify they're no longer in service, last thing you want to do is mortar somebody's <laughs> service shut that's using it. So I uh, can imagine what that would be. <laughs> um, so moving on from that, cleaning and televising. This is just kind of the nitty-gritty, the, you know, the everyday stuff that we do. So, uh, so far this year, we're looking at about 15,000 feet of sanitary we've televised, uh, 90,000 feet of cleaned of sanitary. We're shooting for about a third of the system every year on the cleaning. So that is about 110,000 feet. So we're not too far away. I think we'll hit our mark here this year yet. Um, we can do about, if we, if we stay at it in a month's time, we do... 20 to 30,000 feet, depending upon how much they get at it. So, and then as they're doing that cleaning, they also do the manhole inspections. That's where we find these manholes that HydroClean comes in and fixes. So they've done 172 of those this year to date. Uh, that's a pretty thorough inspection. They have a form they fill out. Uh, the manhole gets graded and uh, basically any defects are noted. So, and then we also, we have the five uh, lift station wet wells um, that's where the sewage comes into the pump station. Clean those, you know, a variety of things. I mean, heavy grease buildup, rags, everything. So clean those twice a year. We try to hit them. Keeps our pumps functioning better. Keeps things from having issues. So, Ron, a couple of years ago, we made an investment in a vac truck for the city. Yeah. The vac truck plays a very large role in cleaning and televising. Can you just tell the UAB maybe a little bit about how you think that benefits you to have that piece of equipment versus contracting that out? Yeah, I mean, for what you see the guys doing right now, it'd be impossible without that vac truck. We're cleaning a, you know, a 25-foot deep wet well, and we're drawing everything from the bottom up. So the whole, the 90,000 feet of sewer, um, you know, we wouldn't be doing that much if we were hiring it out. Um, there's a few things there. I think our guys, I mean, maybe I'm a little biased, but I think they do a better job. They have a little more ownership in it than a contractor coming in, so... And they've all picked up on it well. I mean, um, you know, they are. They take it as a source of pride doing a good job on that. And it's hard to televise without cleaning the sewer first. So you can't get your camera through unless you do that cleaning first. So there's a few things there. I think the guys are getting to know the system a lot better, where our issues are. Um, if they do have emergency calls, they're a lot quicker to respond. They know what they're doing. They're familiar with everything. So emergency-wise, maintenance-wise, um, just as uh, having guys take ownership, I think all of those things are big issues with having our own equipment. One thing that helps me sleep better at night too, that when you're doing all this cleaning, and we, every three years we go through the whole city, you and your crews have identified what I would call a couple hot spots, right? Places that maybe are clogging up or, or potentially clogging up more regularly. You go back and hit those more often, is that correct? Right, and there's a few things, like we had some uh, issues down on Johnson Street um, kind of where the old motel was abandoned on the corner down there. Well, that line, that sewer had been lined previously, but we're, we were getting roots coming in the laterals from that old abandoned hotel. Well, when, the, when it was lined, that hotel was still in service. 
And so they had to cut the laterals out. Well, now the roots is not being used. The roots are starting to come in there. So we're actually going to go in when they're doing their lining next month. And we'll just do a spot lining on those two laterals. So we'll seal those off so we get rid of the root problem down there. We have John uh, from IT on the camera in there, and I'm sure he's taking notes on the computer issues today. <laughs> he's nodding. <laughs> No, did it stay there? I guess we got it now, huh? Okay. All right, okay, so sanitary sewer lining, we just were talking about that a little bit. Um, we're scheduled for, you know, just short of a mile this year, of, and it's all pretty much 8-inch clay pipe. Um, those are those three um, partial liners we're doing, two on Johnson Street, another one over on Wasson, another abandoned lateral. We're going to do the same thing, take care of a root issue. Um, right now, it's tentatively scheduled for October 8th. So they'll be in before that to do their um, cleaning and televising. They actually, the lines they're going to do, they actually clean and televise themselves, take measurements for their liner sizes, things like that. Um, hopping over back to wastewater. Um, I know we talked about this at a few meetings. Um, this is actually what we're looking at doing for our oxidation ditch aeration. You can see the, uh, the picture on the left is the system we currently have. That's that rotor, mechanical rotor, water flying up in the air. Diffused aeration is on the right. So basically you can see a grid of, of diffusers in the bottom of that tank and a mixer and that replaces those two rotors. So and hopefully we cut our horsepower in half what we're using right now. Uh, this was a rotor repair. This is something Bill and uh, Bill Swenson, Jake McNabb did most of the work on this themselves. So you can see um, one of the guys, they came in, um, that was back in May, I got a call on a Sunday morning that the rotor was broken, the tank, and this is after it's been drained down and everything. You can see where on the right hand side is after the repair, but the brake was right there against the wall, the whole rotor fell right down into the tank. So those guys had to bring it back up, and their fix was a, a new shaft was $50,000, and we were looking at you know, we didn't want to do something that, because this is going to go away pretty soon, next year we're looking at putting in those diffusers. So the guy, we kind of talked about it and, you know, what'll work. So welded a flange on each end of that shaft and bolted those flanges together, welded everything up. And, you know, it's, it's going to be our backup system here until we get our diffusers next year. I know Ron is humble and he, he mentioned the $50,000 for a new rotor. And then he just casually said, yeah, we fixed it. So we probably spent five or 10000 or less than that even probably. Less than five. Less than 5000 yeah. So again, you talk about ownership and systems and guys that care. It had been very easy to say, put a new rotor in there, but you know, Bill and Ron and Paul and Luke and Jake and all these guys, they take serious ownership in this. And they took it right upon themselves, do the welding, figure it out and get it done for under $5,000. So hats off to Ron and his department for getting that done. I have to ask, how, how'd you get it lifted? Uh, uh, we had uh, chain hoist actually, got it back up. There's actually in that in the building above that shaft. There's an actual mount for a hoist, so we got it. Got a couple of chain hoists on it. And you really can't tell by that picture, but if you haven't seen it, it's probably is it 30 feet across? I think they're 30 feet. 30 yeah. feet. 24 inch diameter shaft. No, it's not 24. It's a 16 diameter shaft. Um, I couldn't get a real picture, a good picture of before here, but I think all of you are familiar with our sludge ditch, that old sludge ditch. We had outside sludge storage. And we're working on the demo of that right now. We pretty well have the walls of the tank down, what we're going to take down. So now it's a matter of um, we need to put a sidewalk through there, um, then start in with our black dirt and uh, our fill, black dirt, and seating. So hopefully we get a portion of that seating done yet this year. It's getting kind of late now. Um, but we're making progress as we got time we work on this. So the guys have been doing this too. Um, everybody down at the plant kind of chipped in, took their turn in the backhoe there with the breaker on it. And there was a lot of rebar. You had uh, five ace rebar a foot on center. So it was a week worth of hammering on that thing. So. 
And this is the tank right outside the office when you drive in. So that's, yeah. that'll all be leveled. That'll be, their vision is a park-like setting there, I heard built. Yeah, about. And dress it up a little bit, make it nice. Yeah, yeah. Okay, SCADA. Uh, we started on SCADA. I know we went through this early, earlier in the spring. We kind of went through approvals and everything, and we're actually to the point of implementation right now. These are just a couple of screenshots of some of the new system. They should be done with a majority of the water this week, and then they'll move on, finish off lift stations, and then go to the wastewater plant. So we have a good, uh, good start on this. I mean, a majority, all the equipment is there. Um, the software is all, the program is all installed and everything. So now it's just a matter of those guys getting everything installed and getting everything programmed correctly. Uh, lead goosenecks, I think we've talked about this quite a bit over the years. And actually the EPA is doing, they're making changes to the lead and copper sampling rule. So we'll be seeing those probably come around for our next, uh, every three years we need to sample. We're going to see changes next time. And, and this is what it, I mean, we've been through this before, but that lead gooseneck, you can see right down where the water main is, just that little loop. That's where they took the lead and kind of, because it was so pliable, you could bend it any shape you wanted to. You bring it up and you could uh, bring it straight again and hook onto galvanized pipe and run into the house. So that's, whenever we talk goosenecks, we're talking about that short little curve right by the main. The rest typically is galvanized pipe, unless they went in some time later on and replace the portion with copper and that's once in a while you'll find that too yeah i don't want to overstate it but i don't in river falls we don't have a lead service problems we do we we don't know of any per se there might be a couple we don't have complete we don't have services to the extent where like a milwaukee or somebody with lead from the main all the way into the house we don't have those but we might have 40 50 the guys are pretty like much goosenecks. Uh, goosenecks. We're trying. To, we're, we've been going through the process uh, in our asset management plan to identify likely areas. Um, we're narrowing those down, but there's a there, there's a few hundred that are potential. But as we back, as we dig them, or we find new information, we can eliminate some of those. So that number will, will keep coming down, and we do replace some every year. And we're gonna next year. We're gonna step that up a little bit, and. Uh, probably do more replacements and one more important thing so you're also required to do lead testing every year but on yeah. those services that you think might have lead in them including lead right. gooseneck's correct and, and talk to the uab about your report on lead incidents and in those that it's really not detectable right we're not close to to uh action levels so i mean uh, lead or copper we're well below epa action levels i mean we, we've never in the last how many rounds we haven't gotten close so we're, we're sitting good that way. And that, that has a lot to do with your water chemistry, how aggressive your water is. Because you still, even if you have that lead, you need something to dissolve that lead and get it into the water, typically soft water. I mean, a case like Flint pulling river water, which you know is, is aggressive because it's, it's on the acidic side of the pH scale. We don't have that. Our pH is, is higher. We have high alkalinity in our water. Uh, leak detection, we did that this year. We hired a company, came in, did a whole survey-wide system, so they go to every hydrant, listen on every hydrant with their equipment. If they find something, it sounds like it's leaking, then they do um, correlation, which is basically they put a sensor on each side of where they suspect the break to be, hook it to a computer, and that computer takes that, um, those wavelengths coming off of that pipe and correlates it and gives you almost an exact measurement of where that break is or leak or whatever it is. Uh, we'll do this on water main breaks too, just call them in just to save digging blacktop. And I think out of the, we had three main breaks last year. Um, I think we, they came in on all three of them and they were within two feet on every break, so. So how are we looking? Are we finding a lot of uh, leaks? Uh, you can see what we found. So three leaks. There was one hydrant leak, um, which was a bad seat in the hydrant. The guys tore it apart, fixed it. Uh, there was a service leak that's been taken care of. We stead main valve. It's got a really small leak um, out of the packing. We have to dig that yet and fix it. So now there was three. Nothing major, not a huge leak where you'd say there's a, you know, a lot of water going there. So. Um, asset management, we were talking about kind of, that's kind of been the emphasis to try to identify our, our lead goosenecks in the system. 
But a lot of those critical assets that we have, you don't see them. I mean, hydrants, obviously, you do. But compared to the amount of water main we have in the ground, that's pretty minor. So all that buried water main, what we want to do is go block by block throughout the city, evaluate that water main. And then what you do is you consider service area, critical points of service, all those things, age of main, how many breaks. And you have a formula, you put everything on paper and see what you need to fix first. Uh, we have identified some we're trying to work in conjunction with road projects so when we do this we don't have to tear a road out and then they you know something they were going to do anyways in three or four years so we're working with the engineering department to try to try to mingle those two uh, and then we just get into regular system maintenance i mean you know it's the stuff the guys do on a regular basis i mean uh you can see that I threw a picture up there. This is actually, you can't see the depth, but to your right is actually a valve box. You'll see the covers in the streets. That's, there's a rod that goes down in there and we can operate our valves below the surface through there. But that hole's about six foot deep. And you can see it's only about three foot around. And they vacuum excavated that <clears throat> with the vac truck. So we were able to you know, save, a, it's just a small digging area for a six foot hole. They can take that valve box right out and replace it. That one there was broken off on the bottom and twisted, so we couldn't get a valve wrench on it. It was valve wouldn't operate. So they spent about they spent one morning, um, got that all taken care of, and we got the valve operating again, or where we could get on it. So uh, then we got the other stuff: the valve repair, the valve spinning, hydrant flushing. Um, hydrant maintenance and repair. We usually have maybe 10 hydrants a year get hit. By vehicles we have to go in and fix the traffic flange or some if it's an older hydrant uh, replacement so um, and then residential meter change outs that's every year you know roughly 300 meters and cross connection inspections large meter testing college uh, industry whatever where we go in we actually will have a portable meter testing unit we go right in there and run fire hoses outside and test the uh, meter right on site we don't have to pull it out of line and then all our SDWA to safe drinking water act sampling protocol so every year the DNR um, defines what we have to test so and then in this year we're also going through um, unregulated contaminant monitoring so the EPA kind of goes and gives you a bunch of things to test for and identifies the next you know problem down the road that you're going to need to watch out for and that's and that round this year was about eleven thousand dollars worth of testing. So, and that is it for me. Any questions? Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Noreen, Energy Efficiency Coordinator, is going to give you a little update of what he's been working on and some of the things he, some of the business he's been he's been working with. Yeah. Good setup. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to do a, a very short PowerPoint. And it's just thought it. <laughs> not really. Well, I just had to get the IT guy out here. <laughs> Magic fingers. <laughs> Can you help me with my clock on my VCO? Yeah. <laughs> I got a 12-year-old kid. <laughs> All right. So uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, you are going to see is a very short little highlight of Powerful Choices. But next month, we're, we're going to be providing you the 10 year report of Powerful Choices. So very in-depth. So um, if I don't answer all your questions tonight, which I'm sure I, I won't, but uh, there's a lot more to come. So with Powerful Choices, I'll just get to it. Um, there's going to be three parts. Customer appreciation is one. And we served about 800 customers on a uh, nice day in August. And we refined our process quite a bit. Uh, we te tend to get bigger and bigger. But uh, we have tons of cooperation throughout the city. Uh, it's certainly not just one person. So we've, uh, you can see, 
uh, Officer G getting a big hug from a girl uh, and the mayor having a good time. And right here in the council chambers, uh, one of our uh, guys, Stuart, is talking about our forestry program and our tree power, which is underway right now. So a great event, and um, we'll continue to run it. The Blue Bikes, we're in our third year. We continue to as I said, adapt and evolve, kind of figure out what works, what doesn't. Um, uh, what works is people like to use the bikes. What doesn't is people don't like to return the bikes. <laughs> so <laughs> um, we're trying to figure it out. Uh, we, we were really close this year, and you may have talked about it with uh, bringing in a company called Spin. It was no cost. We we're going to get 100 bikes, partner with the university, and then you could check out one of these bikes uh, with an app on your phone and then pay for it. And we had a grant for, through Alina. Uh, there was going to be no upfront cost, and it was, we, were, we were right there, and then the, the bikes were to be, to be delivered, and they weren't coming, so I'm calling these guys. They're out in San Francisco, and um, about a week later, I get a form email that says, we're no longer in the bike business, we're in, just in the scooter business. You want some scooters? <laughs> no, we don't. So it was, um, it's, we're, we are continuing to try to figure out what works best for River Falls. Uh, Blue Bikes has been, um, has been, it's been fun. It's kind of a labor of love sometimes. Uh, we have some places that work great. Hoffman Park, uh, the bikes stay, the kids love it. There's, you know, you come and watch a baseball game and the uh, kids want to ride or park or for camping or triangles. Um, and our other places with, at our neighbor's place uh, and also downtown, uh, those bikes don't tend to stay in one spot. But nonetheless, um, we're, we're figuring it out. All the bikes are donated and we do go through a lot of bikes. Um, and we have lots of people who want to come in and work on them, uh, whether it's uh, these young ladies right here, I would be on the left of the screen. They were the ones, I, mean, I saw the article in the newspaper where they uh, wanted, wanted to help with the blue bike program, so they had a couple of lemonade stands and they had car wash and wanted to come and just do more and more and more and more. And uh, it was pretty fun, it felt pretty good. Uh, and then we have lots of school groups, whether it's National Honor Society or the um, Montessori School or uh, the senior senior day we just all kinds of them that come out and help out and this last year we had a deed grant through uh, American Public Power we had a a student intern did, did a very nice job in keeping bikes in order and ready to go and it's a very nice partnership also with Public Works where we're not out there moving bikes um, but we're able to stage the bikes so when they come by the power plant or they pick up the bikes and move and and put them at the station and also pick up bikes for either repair or uh, put in the recycle bin. So we're right now we are scheduled to give it a go in year four. We have uh, through uh, free bikes for kids and there's another place called Bikes for Kids that they give us a lot of bikes. They can give us um, 200 bikes if we want. We don't take, we take about 120. And we go through about 120 bikes a year. Um, so it's a good thing they're all donated. I say, so if someone's doing a master's thesis on human behavior, this would be a great program to try to figure out what people are doing with bikes and why. <laughs> yeah, right. And um, to our knowledge, that there's only been one in the Kinney. Because everyone always says they're in the Kinney. But we've only found one in the Kinney in three years. That's pretty good. Uh, let's see. Okay. Waiting. My last one was on, and I think it'll get there pretty soon. I'm clicking the button, but uh, it was just on some kits that residential kits through Focus on Energy, the statewide energy efficiency program. They have some programs that they cycle through and. There, some are for residential, some for business, and, and there it shows up. Um, and these kits, they change, certainly. 
and it would be a matter of I want a kit of light bulbs they're free there's some that are co-pays uh, we really promote those to River Falls and we've had over 1200 of these kits uh, out there and the latest one um, and a lot of these we have to push. We're, you know, as we know, we're, we're the kind of the forgotten west side of the state. So uh, Madison gets a lot more attention. So we really have to kind of be aggressive with these guys and say, we want these programs here. The first one of these sets of kits called Express Energy Efficiency. We were scheduled in like 2018 to, to get these. And that was in 2015. And we're like, no, we, we want them right now. So we did. And then with the that there's a thermostat up there on the left or on the right and that one it's 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 simple to get you you go online or you make the phone call and you have to jump through a or answer some questions and so on that's it's easy enough but there are those are some barriers so what we did and again the first time that they were to try it we just asked them like all right can we just have a couple of your representatives here and we'll write down their names and we'll put it in a laptop and then we'll figure out how to do the work on the backside, get account numbers, and so the, so so there are less barriers and people sign up. So um, you know, that's a free, you, that's a free Nest thermostat, correct? Yep. And so sometimes you just need to ask. You say, "All right, focus. Can we do this? Can we try it?" Right. Are those still mm -hmm. available, Mike? Yep. So you how bet. do you how would if you want a free Nest thermostat, you can get one today by doing what? by going to the Focus on Energy website. That's their, probably focusonenergy.com and look it under connected devices. But I think I should, I'll probably get back to you and give you some more detailed information on that to make it easier. Uh, but we did put in our, a bill stuffer in August and uh, it's also, will be on our website if it's not there now. But, um, it's still available and not every and some of these places are not available in all the communities in the state we're considered rural so we are able to get some of these devices so that's kind of what we do we try to hustle for the money uh, from focus on energy and put these programs out in front of people uh, for the betterment of the community and um, it's worked out pretty good so far and so with that just a few pictures of blue bikes um, the customer appreciation event and we have some of these other little off side things uh, we have a blender bike that we bought a few years ago and it's just another way to uh, promote what we do being of value to the community and actually that blender bike goes out quite a bit I just want to say thanks that Diane came out and she was helping serve that day so thank you Diane mm -hmm. and oh, Callan really who's fine. and Callan who's not here today we have never given out any types of awards and then we just don't promote that but if we did give out awards he would have been the MVP of the day he did the corn for two hours hot steaming corn on a very hot day and he was dripping wet with sweat I don't know how he did it without a break for over two hours Kellen Wells Mangold, MVP of the customer appreciation event. <laughs> Hardcore. <laughs> uh, so, like I said, uh, this is just a very high level, and you will be getting a lot more detail on powerful choices next month. Thanks, You're welcome. Any questions? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to quickly just give a few more updates. Uh, as you know, we submitted our FERC uh, hydro relicense at the end of last month. With the help of TRC, that was submitted to FERC. They received the 100 and I think 78 page application and just got an email from them here the last couple days. They're looking at setting up a scoping meeting, they call it, in River Falls, I believe on November 15th and 16th. Um, typically, they have a site tour in the afternoon. That'll probably happen on the afternoon of the 15th followed by an evening stakeholder meeting. That'll be like at 6.30 or 7, that's still TBD. So there'll be a stakeholder meeting probably here at City Hall or maybe the library. Stakeholders will be invited. And then the next morning they work with staff to talk about studies and things like that. So FERC will be here, I believe, November 15th and 16th. So that's the Thursday and Friday right before deer hunting if you want to get acclimated on those dates. So that's happening. Um, big project. Another thing with FERC, uh, they were asking us to do an emergency action plan. That means downriver, if, if the dam should break, um, we, they had classified us as low potential for environmental damage. 
In this past year, they've upgraded our status from low to significant. Um, and then with that significant, they said we have to do a new study. So I just hired heirs to help us out. They, I, then I, when I got that, I asked for a two-year extension because of all the stuff happening with the removing of the lower dam by 2026 and all that. I asked for a two-year extension on that, and they gave me till December 31st to get it done. So um, FERC wants to study by December 31st, so I just hired heirs uh, to help with that study to get that done. So, you know, it's, it's about roughly $15,000 to get that done. And I know this committee is supposed to see any expenditures to the hydros over 5000 but that's for repairs or things like that. This is a, re a required study by FERC. So you might hear something about that. Do you know why the um, uh, why the status changed? Um, it just said, FERC's June 6, 28 letter informed the city that the hazard potential classification of both Junction Falls and Powell Falls dams was being revised from low to significance due to the potential environmental damage and adverse effects on downstream recreation from a failure of the dams. That's, they just looked at it and they said they were wrong the first time. Okay, but it sounds like it sounds like uh, the their concern is potential environmental damage, not the um, uh, repair level of correct. The dams. Correct, that's correct. Okay. Potentially, yes. Right. Okay. Yep, that's it. And I was saying there was a huge connection between what we're envisioning down there in 2026, a connection between that and then delaying the study. And they said there is no connection between the requirements for environmental action plan and what you may or may not happen as part of the city's relicensing of the hydro project. So we agreed to disagree on that. Well, we've, oh, well. <laughs> it, it sounds like FERC continues to be um, uh, a challenging partner. They're a challenging partner, and they're in charge. They yes. just send you a letter yes. in the mail. So anyway, so that's what's happening on those two items. So the, the hydro relicensing, we have begun that five-year process and look for the scoping meeting in mid-November. And we continue to work on the study for them on the hazard reclassification. Um, we continue to work on a cost of service study. I'm working with WPPI and our accounting department looking at uh, cost of service for a potential uh, rate uh, change for electric. We haven't done one in 10 years. I'm not convinced that it's immediately necessary, but they're indicating that we may have to in the future look at a potential rate restructure uh, for electric moving forward. So stay tuned on that. No one is wringing their hands or getting all excited. This isn't happening quickly, but over, I think over the next you know, nine to 12 months, we may be seeing more on that. Um, oh, and you might, some of you may have seen, uh, I, along with Wayne and Mike, were down at the uh, WPPI's annual meeting last week, and some awards were handed out for that. And um, I, think I was going to put this on the overhead doc cam. I might just do that right now, just because we see some nice, happy, smiling faces. I'm going over. <laughs> I think this is pretty cool, actually. We have. Uh, let's see if I can get the doc cam on here. There they are, right there. So what we have, we have Mike Peters on the left, President and CEO of WPPI. There's myself, Mike Noreen, Wayne Cyberling, and Jim, uh, Jim Stowicki. He's the chair of the committee for the awards. He's also the general manager for Surgeon Bay. But more importantly, Wayne Cyberling, he got a Shining Star Award. And the Shining Star, this is amongst all of our peers, 51 communities. The Shining Star Award recipient recognizes utility managers or employees who have shown notable growth and leadership over the past year. These people go above and beyond the call of duty and demonstrate leadership and dedication to strategic initiatives within the utility. And as seen by what Wayne went through earlier, you can see he is a shining star and uh, he got the shining star award and he's well deserved for Mr. Cyberling. And then the Individual Achievement Award was given to Mr. Mike Noreen. And the Individual Achievement Award recognizes a utility manager or employee who has been an active participant in WPPI activities for at least five years and has made a significant contribution to the success of WPP Energy through work on committees, task forces, advisory groups, et cetera. And Mike, uh, you can see through what he has done with our energy efficiency programs here in the city and his involvement, well deserving of the Individual Achievement Award. And then I nominated those two guys and they got the award. And then I find out when I get the call from WPPI that they, some rascal nominated me and I got a volunteer power award 
due to the fact that volunteering in the community, I think tied to a lot of my broadcasting stuff I do for the high school sports, so they gave me a volunteer power award, so that was always flattering, but I want the attention to be focused on these two guys because well-deserved. Good job, Mike Great. and Wayne. Congratulations, thank you. Um, let me see, St. Croix Valley Business Park, we, Wayne talked about that already. Best made cookies, you talked about that. Um, oh, trash and recycling, this is really not part of the Utility Advisory Board, but somebody may ask you about this, so I think it's good you know. Up until three years ago, there was a dollar twenty-five that was on your trash bill that paid for the compost site, spring cleanup, and fall cleanup. When we got the new contract with Advanced Disposal, we went on a little bit of a, uh, I guess, payment vacation on that, just not charging it because we had enough money in that account built up. We didn't really expect it to be three years, but it'll be three years, January 1st. We haven't charged customers for that. So we're bringing that $1.25 back so we can get that account flush again and continue to pay for the compost site, spring cleanup, fall cleanup, and we've now added electronic recycling, which will happen once a year. So those will be available to all citizens. It'll be back on the utility bill come January 1. Council approved that here a few weeks ago. So that's just a heads up for you. Um, well, I think if you use that compost site or spring or fall cleanup one time, you're getting your money's worth on that. So, um, let me see what else I have. Oh, next meeting, UAB meeting, we'll be voting on, uh, we'll be reclassifying the president position to chair and vice chair. So we won't have a president and, and secretary. We'll have chair and vice chair. Mm -hmm. City Council voted on that twice because it was an ordinance change within the city. It needed to be voted on twice. Mm -hmm. That second vote just happened at the end of last month. And then the other rule of that is we can't do it here until 30 days after the second vote, mm -hmm. so which will put us into next month. So be thinking about if you want to roll our two people forward or not uh, for that. So that's happening next month. I think that's about all I have. I was going to talk about squirrels, but I was just going to mention squirrels are 33 percent of our outages. We had another one last Sunday. Someone over on about 7th Street in Division, another big bang, 10 more customers out of power due to the squirrel. So squirrels and woodpeckers are biggest issues mm. for our system. Um, any questions? Just a question on yeah. the rate. You were talking about what WPPI did. Could or could yeah, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. We, didn't we, we sign some agreement or yep. So yeah, that was right. So that, that's for a wholesale power. So here's some good news on that actually. If you've noticed this year, we have a piece of your electric bill. It's called the PCAC, the Power Cost Adjustment Charge. Now no one notices this summer, but it was at zero the whole time. We didn't have it. And last year it was extremely high. One time we had about a two and a half cent PCAC. I know on my bill it was about $41 for one month. This year, because energy prices have been low, and, and WPPI has been real aggressive on the market and buying at the right prices. This year we've had no PCAC in town, which has been really nice. But the contract relates to wholesale power purchasing from them. The rate adjustment would be more tied to things we're doing as a utility and the expenditures that we have on a local level. So the wholesale power is about, I think, 80% of all of our costs with the utility, just buying the power, then reselling it. But that is going to be pretty stable moving forward. We aren't expecting a lot of high uh, increases in wholesale power. Actually, it's been flat or gone down just a little bit in the last three years. But some of our internal costs uh, related to AMI metering and extending power to uh, different parts of town and repairs and overhead underground conversions and things like that, things that we're going to be doing, SCADA systems, things that we're spending money on internally will affect what we'll need to collect from ratepayers in order to keep that up. So yeah, not related to wholesale, more related to internal spending, which we continue to watch. And again, it's been 10 years, so we've done a pretty good job. Any other questions? I feel glad we got Adam's concern about the woodpeckers taken care of today. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad too. <laughs> Well, thanks for bearing with us on all that today. I just thought it was good you guys know. I mean, again, you're the eyes and ears, the utility advisory board. There's a lot going on. You've got dedicated employees who are doing stuff every day, trying to keep the water running, the toilets flushing, and the electricity on. And these guys are doing it, so. Great, thank you very much.
Uh, number nine in the agenda would be the finance report. Sue's here to give us that. Sue, how are we doing? Good. Hello. Hi. Just on a side note, too, I am taking a cost of service study training in Orlando in a couple of weeks, so that'll be good timing. So we're, we're waiting for you to get done with that. <laughs> then we're going to do it. Anyways, as of August 31st, um, the year-to-date revenues for electric were $9.5 million, and the expenses were about the same, resulting in a positive income of 38000 Water fund revenues year-to-date were $1.3 million, and the expenses were one point two, resulting in a positive income as well of 132000 For the sewer fund, year-to-date revenues were $2.2 million, and the expenses were $1.6 million, resulting in a positive income of 595000 Stormwater fund year-to-date revenues were 393000 and the expenses were 383000 resulting in positive income of $9,400. Um, just a, a side note, too, since we didn't meet last week, the dashboards are there for July and August. And that, that's about all I had. Okay. People were watering. I know I can I have some good pluses in the water. Does anybody have any questions on the utility dashboards at all? No. Okay. Uh, number 11 is the utility report, which... I think I've covered that yep. quite thoroughly today. <laughs> Does anybody have any announcements at all? No more than we've had. Just be looking for the FERC uh, scoping meeting in before our next meeting. Okay. For a motion to adjourn, unless anybody has anything else? Move to adjourn. We are adjourned.